Good evening, everyone. And happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> it was done with pure love, really, honestly. Uh, it was. Um, all right, this is the full board meeting of Community Board 5. I'm Vicki Barbero, the chair. Uh, tonight, we'd like to start, we usually start with our electeds, and we happen to have someone here, a council member, Ben Kalos. So, Ben, would you like to come up and start the meeting? Welcome. It's uh -huh. actually pretty cool. Uh, good evening. Thank you for spending Valentine's Day uh, with us and at the community board. Thank you to the members of the public. I came to uh, speak about the mechanical tower, me residential tower mechanical voids text amendment. Can folks hold up the sheet of paper if they have it? Um, and so I want to thank the uh, land use committee uh, for having me a, a week back last week. Um, and, and ultimately, it appears we, we agree in substance, but disagree on, on one piece. So I, I will just jump into it as quickly as possible. Uh, I don't like 432 Park. Does anyone here like 432 Park? OK, so I actually hate it, and I've wanted it gone for as long as I can imagine. I didn't want it to happen again. Uh, when uh, they wanted to build the super tall and extend billionaires row into my district, we actually rezoned to stop it. We're still in court fighting that building because we did successfully rezone, but the person went to the Board of Standards and Rubber Stamps uh, to, to get over it. And so basically, most of New York City is actually protected. So you do have a map that's included in the packet that DCP put together that, that scared me because all I saw was white. So it's, mine is not as accurate as DCP's, but if it's blue area, that should be protected, as you will see that most of your district is yellow uh, because Hmm? It's on fire. <laughs> well, the red portion, so Billionaire's Row itself would be st stopped at least until one of the specific blocks that had a narrow carve out. But the rest of it, where the Maclow building would be, uh, would still be vulnerable. And they've promised to come back in June. And I see a lot of good recommendations. Uh, and so we, uh, I worked with a group called Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District. So we had asked them to just give us a straight height cap. We've also asked for a moratorium. We've worked with an attorney named Michael Hiller. Uh, the issue is that the case law on moratoriums does not allow, as far as I've been advised, uh, when it's been challenged in Westchester, they were allowed to do a six-month moratorium, but not a 24-month moratorium. So that is, and the city has so far refused a moratorium. So we asked for a height cap. Uh, Friends said 210 feet. Civitas said 400 feet. City planning said no to that. Um, we started the Sutton fight with a height cap. We spent one and a half million dollars and still got a close the loophole deal on using tower on base. So we suggested closing a lot of the loopholes you suggested in your second resolution, uh, which is uh, a, a limit on zoning lot mergers, a limit on Florida high ceilings, and then ultimately on anything that's structural. Uh, and that's key insight because one of the things I want to be honest about, there's two diagrams here. One is at 66th Street. This resolution will stop that. The other one is on 62nd Street. That's the building that inspired it. It's literally a barbell building. It's empty in the middle for 150 feet. And we've been told by Gothamist, because DOB won't tell us because they're not being open and transparent, and I think that's a violation of the law, but they've just popped the walls off. And so, uh, Government and private sector will always have a, I'm an entrepreneur, they will always try to innovate in response to regulation, and so I'm unhappy about that, but even though we're unhappy, we're still pushing for it. I know that, you know, I, this, these are really good minutes, by the way. This is like really, uh, please, if you would consider coming to the borough board and sharing how you do your minutes with other boards, this is really our impressive. Or our the re th this the whole packet is pretty oh. impressive. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I would just say, um, and and I, I respect the uh, Land Use Committee incredibly. You have a lot of good experts. Uh, I guess we disagree slightly. We, I agree with all the things you're asking for. In terms of 75 feet, it should be higher. 25 feet, it should be smaller. I think where I disagree is the status quo 
would allow 66th Street and 62nd Street to move forward unfettered. It would allow a lot of the other buildings to move forward unfettered. And my preference would be a, uh, a support with amendments versus a denial with amendments because I believe it is so important to stop the status quo even if they're literally trying to build new loopholes around it. So that was what I came to say. I, I really appreciate the work. We literally agree on everything other than one word. <laughs> it's an important word though. So I want to thank you for having me as a guest here. This is something that we've been working with. Uh, I want to just acknowledge that our Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer has been front and center on this since the very beginning. We've had meetings with her office and Department of City Planning. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, State Senator Liz Kruger, uh, uh, Assemblymember Harvey Epstein, and then your local council members, Keith Powers and uh, Carlina Harvey. Rivera. Right. And uh, they were actually very instrumental in pushing for the June uh, uh, city planning coming back in June to cover your specific area. Does anyone have any quick questions for me while I am here? Uh, thank you very much okay. for hearing me out and I, I respect and appreciate whatever you end up doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Okay, we now start with uh, hearing from our, the representatives of our electeds. Um, two minutes each, coming up three at a time, please. Justin Flagg, Jeremy Unger, and Lori Lori. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Justin Flagg from uh, State Senator Liz Kruger's office. Senator Kruger is the chair of the Finance Committee, so over this past month she has uh, chaired over a hundred hours, well over a hundred hours of um, hearings on the budget, um, on the, every aspect of the budget. We've heard from agencies, uh, we've heard from advocates, uh, we've heard from anybody who wanted to submit testimony. Uh, the next step in the budgetary process is that the Assembly and the Senate will each uh, pass their own budget resolutions, which are a response to the governor's proposal, and that happens sometime in mid-March, and then uh, there'll be three-way negotiations, and hopefully by April 1st, we will have a final budget. So in the meantime, uh, the, the Manhattan uh, Senate delegation is hosting a uh, budget forum so that we can hear from constituents about what your priorities are and what your reaction is to the budget. Uh, it's on Saturday, March 2nd, from 2 to 5 p.m. It's at the New York Academy of Medicine, which is uh, Fifth Avenue and 103rd Street. Anybody mm -hmm. is welcome to come and testify. You can RSVP uh, to our office. You can call our office. Or you can go to the link that's on the bottom of this flyer. There's some in the back. Um, if you want to submit written testimony without appearing, uh, you can send it to budgetforum2019 at Gmail. Um, and I would really uh, encourage everybody to to come or to submit testimony, um, take a look at the budget. It's really the, the most important um, policy document that the legislature um, passes in the year, and it covers a host of very important issues, particularly this year, um, marijuana legalization, congestion pricing, MTA um, management um, reform, climate change. Uh, there's a lot of important things in the budget. so. Um, I encourage you to take a look. You can go to our Senate uh, website, Senator Kruger's nysenate.gov website. Um, there's some information on what's in the budget. It's a hefty document, but it's worth taking a look at. Um, so I encourage you to take one of these flyers in the back, and you can see our, uh, our newsletter with more information. It's been a very uh, productive first month in the session. Thanks. Thank you. heard there was some noise problems in the back. So my name is Jeremy Unger. I'm the CB5 representative for Councilwoman Carlina Rivera. Um, I'm just going to go through a few things. The first announcement is that uh, Councilwoman Rivera was recently appointed as the co-chair of the City Council's task force in the 2020 census, um, which, if you guys all do not know, is going to we're going to be starting the census process, getting our uh, census forms uh, this spring. And we really need to make sure we get a full count for the census because 
New York State relies on uh, millions of dollars, or excuse me, billions of dollars in uh, financial aid, federal financial aid that is determined by the census. We also, our representation in Congress is determined by the census. We could potentially lose one to two seats if there is an undercount, and the councilwoman is going to be working with uh, local community organizations, including community boards, to make sure that we get the word out. Uh, if you'd like to help with that effort, please contact our office. Another news, um, Councilwoman introduced some new legislation this week that we think is pretty groundbreaking around affordability with Councilmember Keith Powers. Office as well? Good? Okay. Um, with Councilmember Keith Powers around security deposits and broker fees. Those bills would cap security deposits and broker fees at one month's rent. It would also give renters an option to pay their security deposits out over a six month installment period. Um, and there were a couple of other bills in that package. We also introduced a piece of legislation to address one of the biggest complaints in the district, which is noise. Um, our legislation would require all emergency vehicles in the city of New York to use a two-tone ambulance siren, which is more commonly found in Europe um, and has been rolled out in Mount, on Mount Sinai ambulances in the last year. And the results we've gotten back, the feedback we've gotten back from that was largely positive. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that legislation. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Lori. It's okay. Could you please pronounce it? I, I can, and that will be one and a half of my minutes. But it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's Lori Hard Joey Rogo. Um, I'm the CB5 liaison for Speaker Johnson. Um, this might be better. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, there's a bit of a rodent problem in the city. We've been getting a lot of complaints. Um, and with that in mind, in January, our office held um, an agency briefing on sanitation. Uh, multiple agencies came um, to explain the problem caused by uncontained garbage and litter, um, the, life cycle, the life cycle sorry, of um, rodents, and what is being done to control the population. It's a fairly fascinating report. Um, reps from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Department of Sanitation, <coughs> Parks, and ACE came. Um, they all attended to guide the discussion. Um, the best part was actually that people from the neighborhood got to locate on a map where they're seeing the worst of the problems, and then we're going to have a follow-up meeting to see what's been done since this first meeting in January. And then one other thing, um, we have a, an event coming up called How to Start a Block Association on March 7th. It's going to be at Our Lady of Pompeii Church from 6.30 to 8.30. There are flyers um, in the back, and um, you can learn how to create a block association and get connected maybe to an existing uh, block association. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next three will be Kevin Jean-Baptiste, Avery Cohen, and Rosie Mendez. Good evening, Community Board 5. This is, I'm Kevin John baptiste from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, last week, I came and presented our high school internship program, which is still rolling right now up until March 11th, and we're still encouraging folks to apply. Um, we just actually launched what we call our resume workshop, where we had some, a training with some of our assistant district attorneys, as well as some of our, some of our support staff in the case that we do receive applications or strong applicants that need some assistance with their resumes. So we understand that high school students may not have much work experience, may not have been affiliated with a lot of activities, so we try to help them pull some of their knowledge, some of their resources to get that on their resumes so that we can sort of diversify the pool of applicants to our high school internship program. I'm also bringing our Gun Violence Prevention Fellowship and this is fairly new. We launched this last year after uh, the March for Our Lives, which happened um, in Washington, D.C., and District Attorney Vance uh, opened his fellowship opened his fellowship up, had three, um, st three students, two college students, and one graduating senior from high school, which came and did initiatives in our office in relation to gun prevention. Uh, we put together an event. Uh, sort of a capstone event that that we finalized with, as well as they advised us on some of public some of our public policies in relation to gun violence prevention. The the application already opened. It started March uh, February first, and it's open until March first. 
and the the website to apply is on the flyer. I left some in the back, and we encourage people to take adv advantage of this. This um, fellowship is is a more broader applicant pool where you don't have to be in high school. Uh, we're asking for anyone that is involved in gun violence or if you're a victim or advocate of gun violence, we ask that they, they take part of this fellowship. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Avery Cohen. I'm here from Senator Brad Hoylman's office. Today was a landmark day for the state legislator because Governor Cuomo signed our Child Victims Act bill into law, which, yeah. thank you all. It was a decades long battle, but if you're unfamiliar with the legislation, it would raise the statute of limitations for victims of child sexual abuse and create a one year window in which survivors are able to come forward and bring claims against their suspected abusers. So we're all thrilled and we're grateful for the governor and all the advocates who are behind us for their support. So it's been a big, it's been a huge couple of weeks in Albany as I think Justin and some of my other uh, colleagues in the Senate have shared with you. We passed a slate of gun control legislation, climate change legislation, and Senator Hoylman has passed three bills to date. So we are thrilled and looking forward to a productive rest of session. On Tuesday, the state legislator held public hearings on sexual harassment for the first time in 27 years. Senator Hoylman testified and he looks forward to working with his colleagues in the Senate to bring about meaningful change through legislation. We also recently introduced a bill on the state level, as Jeremy mentioned, that would cap security deposits at a one month fee to make a, a housing in our city more affordable and accessible. And we also just re introduced a bill that would keep ICE out of state courthouses in New York. So we've been busy. And I think as Justin also mentioned, Senator Hoylman will be co-hosting a budget forum with Senator Liz Kruger on Saturday, March 2nd. If you have any questions, please reach out to our offices and we'd be happy to help you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Can I just quickly ask, there's a state law barring ICE from courtrooms override federal, uh, whatever the feds believe ICE can do? In, in courthouses, in yes, it would in state courthouses, in city and state, because OCA, which is the um, has authority over city and state courthouses, this legislation would work with that, but not federal courthouses. Thank you. Thanks. Is Rosie here? My apologies, I didn't hear my name. Happy uh, Valentine's Day to everyone, so I'm gonna try to make this quick. Um, just important things I need to mention. Um, the next week we're having the borough board, but it's also our budget hearing, and so we are going to hear from all the community boards on their uh, budget needs. Um, but also, prior to the actual budget hearing, we will have DCP presenting on voids. So um, anyone who wants to come is welcome to come to see this presentation. And if you want to testify on the budget, it is open to everyone in the public. And that is Thursday, February 21st, starting at 9, 9. Um, the State of the Borough, the Borough President is having her State of the Borough Sunday, February 24th. <coughs> if you have not seen the tweets, the extension for community board applications, there is an extension on the deadline. It is now February 25th. We figured we also utilize the state of the borough to encourage people to apply. Um, we, we wanted to get uh, a deep pool of candidates so that we could have uh, really you know, good choices to try to meet the needs that were identified um, of what's needed on each of the different boards. So that led to the extension of the deadline. Um, you heard Ben Kalos talk about voids. The deadline to submit um, comments is March 7th, and our office is working with all the community boards to uh, help assist and get that done if you want to <coughs> submit comments. 
Um, we've been working with many residents from Community Board 4 and 5 around L train issues with the M7 and um, issues with parking here on 14th Street, and I will report more on that. The, I just will take one second, because I don't know if anyone knows this. Um, he was a public member for a very long time. I don't know if he was an appointed member, uh, but last week, Thursday, Jack Taylor passed away. Oh. And um, he was a dear friend. Um, I got to work with him on uh, landmarking Tammany Hall, and he came and I had him sit up front. Um, so he worked on that for many years. And it was so exciting when we got it passed and mostly to see the look on his face. He had been declining in health, but he had been in good spirits. And I don't have any information about services. When I do, I will get it yeah, to the board and let you know. And, um, and if, you know, today we can express our love for a very wonderful man who dedicated so much to this community and this community board. And I'll take my moment of silence after the board meeting so that we can get on with the agenda. Thank you very oh, much. Rosie, send it to us in a typed post-it. Okay. Do you yeah, remember? Right. Do you remember? <laughs> well, he, everything that he did was on a typed post-it. It really yes. was. I think I may still have some of those. Um, I kept I them as memorabilia. He was a wonderful man. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, next three. Abigail Bessler, Caitlin Little... Latiri and Phil Marius. Mm. Hello, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. There's no one I would rather spend it with. <laughs> uh, first, I just wanted to highlight the council members' work in making sure that the J.P. Morgan Tower on Park Avenue had the full amount of public open space, which actually just came out this afternoon. The building will now have 10,000 square feet of open space, which is what the community board called for. Um, thank you for your advocacy. The council member looks forward to reviewing the full application. Uh, yesterday, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, council member Powers joined with council member Rivera to introduce legislation to limit broker fees and security deposits. Uh, <coughs> broker fees can be up to, you know, people are paying up to 14,000 upfront for the average um, uh, rent apartment in Manhattan, which is absurd. Um, the legislation is part of a five bill package to combat excessive costs associated with renting an apartment in New York City. Uh, the council member also introduced a bill that would create a standard application process for new parking placards to address placard abuse. Uh, and I also wanted to make sure to touch upon the issue of excessive mechanical voids. Uh, while the council member is encouraged the city is looking at closing this zoning loophole, he knows there is still much to be done. Uh, the current amendment excludes much of Community Board 5, and there are other issues that the Community Board has brought to our attention. Uh, we must include all areas of the city to create a fair standard. And lastly, the council member is sponsoring a few events I wanted to bring to your attention. He's partnering with the Doe Fund to host a clothing drive to help uh, formerly incarcerated and homeless men with workforce apparel. So you can bring items of clothing to our district office. And he's also partnering with the Department of Finance and Council Member Rivera to host a property tax workshop on February 27. And you can get more information in our newsletter in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm from Assembly Member Linda Rosenthal's office. Um, I wanted to bring a couple of announcements. Uh, on March 8th, the Assembly Member is holding a Screedry Homeowners Exemption Clinic with the Department of Finance um, in our district office. Um, as Avery mentioned this morning, the Child Victims Act was signed into law. Um, the Assembly Member was a co-sponsor of this bill, and it's been a really exciting couple of weeks in Albany. Um, and just this week, um, the assembly member's legislation on mechanical voids at the state level um, was given a bill number and introduced um, back uh, at the end of um, in like the middle of last year when we started hearing about this uh, loophole that's been used increasingly across the city. Um, the assembly members started working with urban planners, local advocates, and groups on what can be done at the state level, and so her bill, which is. A5026 would amend the New York State Multiple Dwelling Law 
um, and it would impact the whole city. Um, and so this would require all void space exceeding either 5% of the total uh, building height or 20 feet to be counted toward the total FAR. And it, after that, each additional 12 feet um, of void space height will be counted as an additional floor, floor for the purposes of calculating the total FAR. And so that was introduced this week. And again, that's A5026 um, if you want to take a look at the further details of that. Um, and so if you have any questions or um, any uh, would like to look any further into her legislation, feel free to give a call to our office. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Marius. I'm the community liaison in Assemblymember Gottfried's office. Um, some uh, details concerning CB5 and the 75th Assembly District. Yesterday, the MTA and DOT briefed legislators on um, the new, new L train project. Uh, the project begins in April. But the select bus service um, originally planned for um, the 14th Street um, will not be implemented until late summer or early fall. Um, and early fall, the reason being they have to remove the, um, the floor bed um, that was um, affiliated with the previous project in preparation for the new one. And the subway station at 14th Street and 6th Avenue will have uh, elevator service connecting to the L train platform, um, but not the F and M platforms until further notice. And the reason for that is because of financial um, feasibility problems and um, the platform being too narrow. Tomorrow, um, the assembly member is hosting a television program um, at MNN on the issue of luxury um, high-rise towers. Uh, for example, the, the one that was proposed at uh, 30 West uh, 66th Street by uh, Extel Corporation. His guests will include uh, the Honorable Council Member Kalos, uh, President of the 29th Street Association, uh, Mario Messina, and Executive Director of the Landmark West, uh, Sean uh, Corsandi. And the program will air on MNN Sunday, March 3 at 7 p.m. and Wednesday, March 6 at 9 p.m. Now from the legislature, uh, agenda was signed into law. The last time CB5 met, it had only passed both houses. Uh, the assembly member is proud that it's finally reached uh, the governor's office and the ink has dried and now it's the law of the land. Um, you know, he's, he's passed the bill 17 times uh, introduced it 17 times rather, and the assembly has passed it 11 times, and each time it's been held up by the Republicans in the Senate, thanks to him, efforts of the activists and the new Democratic majority in the Senate, uh, it's now uh, law. Um, and you could find more details on these items in the community newsletter um, that's in the back. And if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to me or anyone in our office. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next three will be Michael Stinson, Sarah Haig, and we move into hearing from the public with George Mahaltzis. Hi everyone, Mike Stinson from Comptroller Scott Stringer's office. Um, sorry that we're all here together tonight. It's a little depressing that we're spending Valentine's Day together, but thank you all for your commitment to your communities. It's very important that you're here and you're not spending money on an overpriced meal tonight. So thank you. I just have two quick announcements. Last year we started an MWBE university. It was very successful. We were able to work with over 700 MWBEs throughout the city of New York. This year we have our first one, first workshop coming up on February 28th. All of our workshops are from 9.30 a.m. till 12 p.m. Five out of the six workshops do take place at one center street. The other one is at Microsoft offices in Times Square. I have uh, flyers in the back for you if you're interested. And then we have our summer internship program, which we're still taking applications for. We do pay our interns, so if you know any college age students or graduate students that are interested. We have community affairs positions, audit, <coughs> finance, every, every agency within our department, within our office has internships for the summer. They are paid. It's a program from June 10th to August 8th. They work four days a week. And if, you're at, if they're interested, they can apply online. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions?
Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Haig. I'm from Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney's office. I'll give you all a quick update on what the Congresswoman is working on here and in Washington. Uh, first, the Congresswoman has been working hard to ensure that the 2020 Census fairly and accurately counts all New Yorkers. Carolyn is the co-chair of the House Census Caucus and author of the Census Idea Act to remove the citizenship question from the 2020 Census. Um, and she recently led her colleagues in the House of Representatives in filing an amicus brief in the Supreme Court case of Department of Commerce versus New York. Uh, last month, a federal judge in New York ruled that the Trump administration must remove the citizenship question from the 2020 census, and the administration has appealed that decision to the Supreme Court. Uh, this amicus brief makes it clear that the House of Representatives takes a firm stance on enforcing the constitutional requirement that everyone is counted in the census and that the New York District Court decision ordering the removal of the citizenship question must be upheld. The Congresswoman has also been working hard here in the district to spread awareness of what's at stake in the 2020 census and is hosting a series of town halls on the topic. The next one will be at the Williamsburg Hotel in Brooklyn on Sunday, February 24th, and there will also be one in Long Island City on Saturday, March 16th. There's more information about both events on our website. On another note, the Congresswoman has recently introduced bipartisan legislation on Holocaust education. Earlier this month, she joined Jew Jewish advocacy groups at the Center for Jewish History to address a national rise in anti-Semitism and announced the reintroduction of her Never Again Education Act. This is a bipartisan bill that will create a new grant program at the U.S. Department of Education to give teachers across the country resources and training necessary to teach, the teach our children the important lessons of the Holocaust and the horrific consequences of hate and intolerance. And finally, the Congresswoman is honored to have received her committee assignments for the 116th Congress. Most notably, Carolyn is now the Vice Chair and Top Democrat on the Joint Economic Committee, and she is the Chair of the Financial Services Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets. Thank you so much for your time. I'll be in back if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am George Mahalsis. Oh, happy Valentine's Day. I'm George Mahalsis. I am the Vice President for Government and Community Affairs at the New York Public Library. I want to thank you all for carefully considering our proposal to widen our loading dock and to add a public entrance in plaza on the 40th Street side of our iconic 42nd Street Library. The proposed changes will better connect our historic building to the community, make the library's collections, exhibitions, and programs more welcoming and accessible to the public, and improve circulation for people and books throughout the building. These improvements are part of an overall master plan for the library that will increase public space, create an education center for students, add exhibition spaces, and double the number of seats for researchers. All of this work is crucial for better serving the public now and in the future. And really, that is the most important thing. All of the work we are planning to do in Midtown is to strengthen the library's foundation and to prepare our buildings to serve the people of this community and of the city for generations to come. Libraries and all they stand for, the fight against misinformation, the fight to preserve and make accessible the world's knowledge are more important than ever and we are preparing to ensure its longevity and strength. We appreciate the questions you raised at the Landmarks Committee meeting and we have worked to address them in the letter as well as the updated presentation that we shared with the committee. We listened carefully to what you had to say and went back to the drawing board to adjust certain design elements. For example, the height of lighting was lowered significantly based on your feedback. We also want to make clear that if the board needs any further information about the master plan, which is available online and has been shared in multiple public and individual meetings, we are more than happy to share that with you. Thank you again for considering this. We do believe that the changes will have a positive impact on our neighborhood and on the city. And in a related note, what I wanted to also share with you tonight, we're excited to share that our new exhibition, Love and Resistance, Stonewall 50, officially opened today at the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building. The show uses images from the library's research collections to honor the legacy of the Stonewall riots, a vital milestone in LGBTQ and New York City history. The powerful, thought-provoking exhibition will run through July 14th. We hope that you will find your way there because it really is an amazing exhibit and one that I believe everyone in the city should, should see. Thank you and Thank good night. You.
Okay, next three will be Gail Fox, Charles Zalbin, and Matt Robinson. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm reading this from, written by Joanne Schindelheim, who, like me, resides at 10 West 15th Street, an apartment building with 429 units. And we did anticipate serious impacts to the, with the changes DOT planned to put in place on 14th Street. We're encouraged by the news that the busway has been abandoned but other aspects of the plan currently, quote, to be determined need to be defined in a helpful manner. I sent my testimony by email so that I could read Joanne's here, and I'll leave a copy of each with Luke at the front desk. The critical service entrance for our building is 7 West 14th Street. Several months ago, as part of the street changes made in anticipation of the busway, DOT relabeled our frontage no standing zone. This means we've lost our commercial vehicle access for residents' deliveries, move in and out, contractors handling materials. Our significant frontage, again, 7 West 14, includes a number of retail stores who have lost legal use of this space for deliveries. DOT planning maps have our delivery zone on the south side of 14th Street. Seven West is on the north side. So, so they have us just east of Sixth Avenue. We, in other words, we really have a dilemma. Our main pedestrian entrance is 10 West 15th Street, and that is structurally impossible to be used as an entrance for deliveries and service, and it's not feasible for the stores located on 14th. We make regular outreach to DOT and are advised they cannot offer any information at this time. We ask for your support in this matter. Copies will be available. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, good evening, I'm Charlie Zalbin. I'm going to echo a little bit of what Gail had just said. I live at 70 East 14th Street we also have the similar problem, except we don't have an alternate entrance. Everything is on 14th Street. <laughs> uh, if the busway is implemented the way it was originally planned and, and, and the plans aren't dropped the way they're talking about right now, then we will only have access to our building by foot. And I'm sure that I noticed on the map of Community Board 5 that Basically, Fifth Avenue, the, the blocks between uh, Union Square West and Sixth Avenue will be greatly impacted. So we have about 1,200 residents in our building, and I'm sure there are other people on 14th Street as well who will also be impacted by this. So I hope you give consideration to the changes that the MTA is talking about, about dropping the busway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Robinson. I'm a resident in the neighborhood. I have an architectural background. One of the concerns at the construction that's going to be 14th and 6th Avenue on the two corners, the, the bottleneck that is proposed and is going to be created is actually completely unnecessary. What you can do is, uh, if you're familiar with the area, there are fingers on the south end of the street that actually go uh, north and south. So you can actually enter on either going uptown or downtown from the south side of the street. So what you could do is instead of having the construction, um, uh, the cranes and stuff like that, on 6th Avenue, you can easily have it on 14th Street. Those entrances on 14th Street are not needed at all because you have them on the south side of the street with passageways. I think there are three of them. I know there are three of them. There may be a fourth one but there are at least three of them so that your egress and stuff like that still can be maintained uh, and the construction so that you, instead of it being two lanes, it can be three lanes. But basically, you can take the cranes and put them on the 14th Street side, which is um, less needed than the 6th Avenue cor corridor. The concerns that I hear is that because of the bottleneck, 
everything back is going to be clogged up and everything forward is going to be uh, clogged up and everyone's concerned about the bus lane and everything like that. But uh, seriously, look at if you walk that area and look at the passageways that cross 6th Avenue underground, there's an easy solution for that, uh, that problem that doesn't cost any money. You have to re remove a, a newsstand and maybe some entrances in terms of the covering of it, but easily there should be something structurally that's easy to do. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next three will be Daryl Cochran, Sharon Pope Marshall, and Charles Warren. Hi, good evening everyone and happy Valentine's Day. Um, I just want to come and introduce myself. My name is Daryl Cochran. I am the director of the Manhattan Community Service Center for the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Um, and on another hat, I also serve on Community Board 12 uptown. Uh, we don't have as many cameras up there though, so this is interesting. But um, So uh, if you don't know about the Commission on Human Rights, we're basically the city agency that enforces the non-discrimination laws. We work in five major areas, employment, housing, public accommodation, uh, discriminatory harassment, as well as bias-based profiling by law enforcement. Uh, I've been with the agency about three and a half years, and we've expanded the number of protected classes to now we're at about 24, 25, I think. So, you know, some of the work we do, if you um, or someone you know experiences discrimination in any of the areas I mentioned, please uh, reach out to us. Our number is 718-722-3131, or they can just call 311 and ask for human rights. Uh, and some of the other things we do as well is working uh, locally with uh, law enforcement and community boards uh, when incidents of bias happen. Uh, just uh, last year, there was an incident where swastikas were uh, graffitied on a car just a couple blocks from here, actually. So we worked with law enforcement on that to get that removed and notify the owner. Um, and we also do free workshops uh, in our community service center, which is located at 22 Reed Street uh, downtown. Um, our next one is on uh, March 4th. Um, and that's it. Have a good night. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and um, good evening. Happy Valentine's Day. My name is Sharon Pope, and I'm the director of community outreach for Bike New York. And I'm here to talk to you for just a moment um, about some of the work that we do, and in particular in um, bringing to New York City schools uh, bike assemblies. And what we do is we send a trained uh, bike instructor for free to schools and also youth organizations to teach uh, young people the rules of the road in a fun, engaging, and exciting way. So if you're interested, um, if you're a representative of a school or youth organization, you can contact me um, in particular or call Bike New York. We would love to come out to your school or organization, talk about the rules of the road, and really engage our young people in cycling in the city. Thank you so much, and happy Valentine's Day again. Oh, by the way, I have flyers that I'm going to be uh, passing out to the community board members. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Charles Warren. I'm the president of the Committee to Save the New York Public Library. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Landmarks Committee for uh, holding a very constructive hearing uh, last week uh, where we discussed the proposed additions and changes to the New York Public Library, especially along 40, uh, 40th Street. Um, this proposal is just <coughs> the tip of an iceberg, 
And it's an unfortunate tip of an iceberg because it ignores the historic context of the New York Public Library by introducing a whole vocabulary of different pavings and different benches and uh, sort of modernist uh, aesthetic into the historic context. I urge you to uh, uh, ask the New York Public Library to reconsider um, the design elements that they're introducing into this block-sized composition that otherwise is very coherent. <coughs> um, lurking underneath the tip of the iceberg, though, is a whole interior plan that has never been described adequately to the public. And since George Mihaltes has just offered to give you more information, I <coughs> suggest that you demand the plans, the actual plans of what it is they're doing inside, because their master plan does not include that. If you want to see our conjectural plans of what, uh, what they're doing inside the building, go to savenypl.org, where we have tried to construct a, a, a critique of their uh, master plan, which includes this 40th Street entrance and the loading dock. Um, action is needed. SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, threw up their hands. They have jurisdiction over the interior of this building, but because the work is being done with private funds, um, all they're given is the master plan that you can all see on the New York Public Library website, and they said, we can't tell what it is they're doing inside from that master plan. So please go to savenypl.org, and please ask the library to reconsider this plan. You can require them to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last two will be Theodore Grunwald and Tom Collins. I could use one right now. Uh, my name is Theodore Grunwald. I'm the vice president of the Committee to Save the New York Public Library. Uh, good, good evening, um, Community Board 5. Um, on February 5th, our organization, uh, multiple good government groups, library protection organizations, library users, and neighbors testified against the New York Public Library's proposal before the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 5. Uh, we were encouraged that the committee did not endorse the library's proposal. Uh, we urge the full board to support the committee's recommendations, which also include increased community board oversight and greater transparency. We request also that the matter be taken up, uh, that is the matter of the entire master plan, at the next meeting of the Budget, Education, and City Services Committee. There are two items which, I, which speak to the New York Public Library's design, which I'd like to briefly touch on. While it is true that the Landmarks, that the Landmarks Committee of this body and the Landmarks Preservation Commission does not regulate use, every design emerges out of deeper philosophical concerns, which are the business of this body. The creation of a new exterior entrance dedicated to high school students raises the larger concern of segregated access. Uh, this proposal, uh, this separate but equal ground floor entrance, denies students the experience of the memorable and beautiful entry sequence uh, on Fifth Avenue with its carefully designed procession through a sequence of extraordinary one-of-a-kind rooms. I'd like to remind this body that this building belongs to all the citizens of New York City uh, and that while the New York Public Library claims that the new entrance supplements its existing disabled entrance or ADA entrance on 42nd Street and will be open to all, library management often says one thing and does another a good example of which is found at the Donnell Library's replacement, where public access is blocked by a permanently locked door adjacent to the luxury Baccarat Hotel that replaced the Donnell Library. And the second and last item is on the matter of the proposed carving of donor names at the new entrance. I'd like to remind Community Board 5 that Trump advisor Stephen Schwartzman's name is already carved uh, in the uh, Danby marble of the exterior uh, five times uh, on the building's exterior. I urge the board to insist on a plaque instead. 
Given the frequency that plutocrats are removed from boards, David Koch's removal from the board of the American Museum of Natural History, and Antonio Villar's uh, recent removal from the board of the Metropolitan Opera being two uh, very recent and very good examples. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Thomas Collins. I'm a graduate student at the CUNY, CUNY City College. And like many students, I rely on the New York Public Library at 42nd Street for research and access to their unrivaled collections. I'm greatly alarmed over the proposed alterations presented before the community board this evening. Uh, along with many library users, I attended the multiple public meetings, charrettes devoted to the planned renovations, and I see very little in the master plan that addresses the needs of the public that were communicated quite clearly at those meetings. For years, the public has urged NYPL to prioritize hiring additional librarians, rehabilitating, rehabilitating the seven levels of book stacks for on-site storage, and expanding the operating hours later in the evenings. Instead, library officials appear committed to spending millions on a new cafe, an expanded gift shop, and a new entrance, which may not even be necessary. Uh, specific to this proposal, I strongly object to the additional inscription dedicated to Blackstone CEO and Trump advisor Stephen Schwartzman that will be carved uh, on the historic marble facade. For those not keeping count, Mr. Schwartzman already has his name carved on five other locations on the exterior. By comparison, Astor, Linux, and Tilden's names only appear once on the facade. As an alternative, I, uh, I think a, a plaque would be more than appropriate. Lastly, the proposed Center for Research and Learning might be better located on the ground floor level, currently being used by the Mid-Manhattan Swing Space. The current MML Swing Space operates uh, the same amount of square footage as the proposed educational complex, and this would have the added benefit of being closer to the existing 42nd Street entrance and would not require such a heavy-handed intervention on the 40, 40th Street facade. The proposed new staircases would also not have to be constructed throughout each floor, and the building already has ample vertical circulation and existing, an, an existing grand staircase on the south wing that should re be returned to public use. Although I look forward to the reopening of the renovated Mid-Manhattan Library, I can find very little in NYPL's master plan for the 42nd Street Library that actually benefits researchers and members of the public. Uh, the entire planning process has been uh, demands more transparency so that more feedback can better inform the decision-making process. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes the public session. The board now moves into our business session. Uh, only board members are permitted to take part in this part of the meeting. It's when we do our deliberation on those items and applications that have come before the committees and they're now coming to the full board as well as reports from various committees. So entering the business session, I need a motion to adopt our minutes. So moved. And a second. second. Okay, a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Atherdale. Yes. Vaccaro. Beichman. Yes. Benzig. Yes. Chu. Yes. Clark. Yes. Dale. Yes. Gatto, yes. Goldberg, yes. Gasha, yes. Greeley, yes. Haas, yes. Harris, yes. Isaac, yes. Johnson, yes. Kabak, yes. Kalaforsky, yes. Kinsella, yes. Logosico, yes. Mafia, yes. Mann, yes. McCall, yes. Miller, yes. Raybar, yes. Sandler, yes. Shapiro, yes. Ludskin, yes. Smith, yes. Webb, yes. Weintraub, yes. Whalen. Yes. Okay, they pass, and we'll go right into our committee reports, starting with transportation and environment, David. <clears throat> All right, we have uh, two applications and a report tonight. I'd like to start with the applications. Okay. Um, I'd like to have them deemed read and bundled. Okay, so done. Great. If everyone could turn to page three, our first application tonight is an application from Eastern Coachways. This is one of our curbside bus stop locations that we seem to get quite frequently. In this case, it's a fairly uh, easy application for our review. The proposed stop is at 175 Madison Avenue, which is on the east side of the street between East 33rd and 34th Streets. There's only one daily pickup at 11 and one daily drop-off at 5.30. Uh, 
Uh, although we wish the 5.30 drop-off were at a different time that's not in the middle of the rush hour, we <coughs> felt that this stop was in a relatively quieter part of Midtown than other proposed stops. The bus uh, would be sharing a bus stop with current city service, but the city buses do not run on weekends. The BX M18 only runs express and it stops rather infrequently. DOT felt that the proposed application would not interfere with the existing bus service and the committee voted to approve this bus stop unanimously. Okay, does anyone have a conflict with this resolution? Any questions? Any comments? Okay, next reso. Next resolution is for the Morning Sun Bus Company. It's another bus stop. This is in front of 201 West 37th Street on the north side between 7th and 8th Avenues. Uh, the committee felt that this bus stop was more problematic than the one we just reviewed. Currently, another tour company called Vision Tours operates this bus stop. The Bryant Park Corporation had expressed their deep concerns for the additional street traffic and sidewalk congestion that long queues of people waiting for buses would uh, attract. The proposed pickup times of 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. are right in the middle of uh, the peak rush hours and the community, I'm sorry, the, the committee voted to deny this unanimously. Okay. Any conflicts with this application? Any questions? Any comments? All right. We'll vote on these two, Wally. Whalen. Yes. Weintraub. Yes. Webb. Yes. Smith. Yes. Slutskin. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Sandler. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Miller. Yes. McCall. Yes. Mann. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Logosico. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Kalaparski. Yes. Kabat. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Isaac. Yes. Harris. Yes. Haas. Yes. Grayley. Yes. Gashow. Yes. Goldberg. Yes. Gatto. Yes. Dale. Yes. Clark. Yes. Chu. Yes. Benzie. Yes. Beichman. Yes. Uh, Athenel. Yes. Okay. The resolution's passed and we have a report. Okay. So just a very brief <coughs> report on an issue that we will be reviewing in the weeks and the months ahead. Uh, City Council is preparing to review four potential uh, pieces of legislation that touch on bicycles and scooters and e-bikes and e-scooters. Uh, there are four bills. I'm going to read some from some notes here. The first is 1264, which would legalize, and I'll explain these after I give this brief uh, readout, but 1264 would legalize throttle-powered bicycles to allow them up to 20 miles per hour. 1250 would legalize e-scooters up to 15 miles per hour. Both of those provisions would also uh, decrease the fine that currently exists for operating those vehicles from $500 to $100. 1266 is a pilot program that's proposed to have a dockless scooter system that's similar to the city bike share that we currently have, only these would be dockless, meaning they don't go into set locations, you just leave them uh, wherever you choose. I don't know why you're shaking your heads. Uh, 1265 is a bill that would retrofit existing bikes that are illegal to let them fit into the requirements of electric bikes that can only go up to 20 miles per hour. So let me back up now and talk a little bit more about all of these. First, the Transportation Committee will be reviewing uh, these ideas and we will be working on what we believe is a strong advisory opinion for City Council uh, that concerns these four bills. We will be working with the BEX Committee in conjunction for the last piece, which is uh, encompassing a budgetary cons consideration to allow for this program to retrofit these illegal bikes to make them uh, le street legal. Uh, so we will be doing that. Tonight I just want to sort of put this on everybody's radar so that you know that these things are in the works and that we are discussing them. Now, taking a step back, uh, the reason we aren't coming up with an opinion on this immediately is because City Council isn't even sure if they are able to vote on these themselves. There is a concern that this is only a state government power and that the city is not uh, authorized to, to put these into place. Uh, Governor Cuomo, in his pending budget bill, has said that he is going to give the power to smaller municipalities, that means city council would be able to vote on this. So the likely expectation is that once the budget passes, city council will be able to 
uh, to take these under consideration and to vote. Meanwhile, we want to make sure that we are reviewing it and thinking thoughtfully uh, on our opinions about these. Um, we don't have an opinion. The, the committee has not discussed this yet. Uh, I barely know any more than what I've just told you right now. Um, I can give you a, a couple of details uh, just so that you can think about this as we go. And, uh, and we will certainly be providing more information as we go. But uh, the dockless e-scooter share pilot program, two things that are important for this board. One, it is unlikely that this will happen in Manhattan. This is most likely going to be a pilot program, if at all, in the outer boroughs, uh, that especially those areas that aren't connected by current public transportation. So the thought would be that you start that in areas that don't have uh, subway stops nearby, bus stops, or city bike locations. Uh, secondly, if the pilot program does come to pass, it will be subsidy free, most likely. So this would not be any public dollars spent into this uh, pilot program. Um, the other piece would be the retrofit program uh, to make bicycles that are currently powered by electric motors that allow the bicycle to go faster than is currently allowed. The idea would be a program put into place, potentially, that would allow the city to help people whose income does not exceed 200% of the poverty line. So, <coughs> so the poor, the, the uh, I guess the poorest members of the community that are using electric bikes that don't currently meet uh, the legal limits would be able to retrofit their bicycles so that they could be street legal. Uh, this is geared mostly toward uh, delivery people from restaurants who are bringing our seamless delivery foods. Uh, they currently get fined the most frequently and the thought is that perhaps they are uh, in a position to uh, least be able to afford those fines. Um, like I said, we're still exploring it. This is what's on the table right now. Uh, we will, in the coming weeks, coming months, uh, month, have uh, a better position and more information to give. That's great. Thank you, David. Oh, one last thing. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, I knew nothing about this. I did not know the details. We had tremendous help from Jonathan Raybar, and we had tremendous help from Tristan Haas from the Bex Committee, who both worked to put together a lot of notes. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that they worked really hard, and uh, we are indebted to them. And Thanks. there's lots more to come. <laughs> Did you hear that, Jonathan? There's lots more to come. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Public safety, quality of life, Nick. PSQL has a quick update for you. If you recall, last month I told you that PSQL had gone off the grid and uh, none of our data was appearing on the website. That turned out to be not quite true. The data was there, but it was very, very hard to find. Um, so we've remedied that. Um, there are now links to all of our information on the committee website and elsewhere on the CB5 website so people can readily access, access it. If you were to look um, at one of the, those links, you'll see that for January, PSQL reviewed 119 applications, 87 of which were renewals, 23 new liquor license applications, and nine various changes, alterations, things like that. Um, three of those um, had conditions and stipulations uh, in, uh, memorialized in affidavits, which are now accessible um, through the website. Just go to the data, click on it, and it'll take you to the affidavit. So if you are interested in any operation and what the restrictions are, you can now find those on the public website. Um, PSQL is current review, currently reviewing 24 applications. Um, those are the applications that are currently in due diligence process. We're meeting with residents, we're meeting with business owners, and if there are any issues with these licenses, those will be brought to a committee hearing and, uh, and then brought to you for a vote. Um, currently, these items are not published on the website, but within the next month or so, uh, these will be published so that at any time, the public will be able to see what PSQL is doing, and, um, and have access to the current uh, agenda items. Okay, that's great. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you, Nick. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to parks and public spaces, Clayton. 
All right, um, I think I would be remiss not to just acknowledge Jack Taylor's yeah. uh, contribution to our community board and, and to the Parks Committee. For many years, I had the privilege of working with him uh, when he was a public member on that committee, and um, the, the number of times that he would help by sending articles from the Villager newspaper, photocopied, sent to my home address, Right. on a typed envelope with post-it notes giving context, typed right. on the margins of the article. And the crazy part is a lot of those articles I actually would not have seen otherwise. <laughs> so um, I appreciate that a lot. I also, I also couldn't believe how kind of strangely formal he would be at times when he would call me. And I'd answer the phone and he'd be like, hello, Clayton, this is Jack Taylor. I am a member of your <laughs> parks committee. Like, yeah, I know who you are, Jack. <laughs> so crazy. Um, but his, he was so consistent and so reliably strong in his advocacy for public space. And he'll, his voice has already been missed for years. And, and I'm sorry to hear the news. So I wanted to say that. Thank you. Uh, we have two resolutions tonight. I'd like to have them deemed read. So do you. And let's bundle them. Okay. The first is a newsstand application for Broadway and West 35th Street. This applicant, we never heard from the applicant. We did hear from the applicant's representation, who quite helpfully gave us a very clear sense of their intentions within minutes of getting the email from the board office inviting them to the committee meeting in which they let us know that they had no intention of cooperating, refused to post, would not be attending, and that we were overstepping our bounds and asking them to do so. So we took great joy in unanimously denying support for their application. <laughs> That's it. Okay. <laughs> any conflicts? Any questions? Any comments? Next. Next is applications from Union Square Partnership for their annual roster of programming for Union Square Park. This, has, this roster has a lot of support in the community for many years. There are not very substantive changes this year, uh, with perhaps the, the detail of the holiday market kickoff effect event. This year is called Happy Paw La Days, which is being rebranded to incorporate dogs. So you are invited to bring your dog for a photo opportunity on a big couch that's going to be in Union Square Park. Um, people were very excited about that. With the exception of Harvest in the Square, which is their annual fundraiser, these are all events that are free and open to the public. Uh, there's a lot of support for these events in the community, and we voted unanimously to support this roster again. Okay. Any con <coughs> excuse me, any conflicts? Any questions? Comments? All right. Seeing none, we are voting on both of these resolutions. Athenale. Yes. Beichman. Yes. Benzie. Yes. Chu. Clark, yes. Dale, yes. Gatto, yes. Goldberg, yes. Gasha, yes. Greeley, yes. Huff, yes. Harris, yes. Isaacs, yes. Johnson, yes. Kabak, yes. Kalafarski, yes. Kinsella, yes. Logosico, yes. Mafia, yes. Mann, yes. Nicole, yes. Miller, yes. Raybon, yes. Sandler, yes. Shapiro, yes. Slutsky, yes. Smith, yes. Webb, yes. Weintraub, yes. Whalen. Yes. Okay, resolutions pass. We're on to Bex, Bex. with Renee. Hi, um, quick update on Bex. We've had two presentations uh, this month, no resolutions. The first <coughs> presentation was um, from the Department of Sanitation regarding the commercial waste zone program that's currently under scoping review. Um, right now, the commercial waste system in New York is based on the open market. Private carters compete for the opportunity to collect waste and refuge and recyclables and organics from all the commercial businesses. Um, the city believes that this competitive market has resulted in some inefficiencies, like extra truck traffic, increased pedestrian safety concerns, traffic congestion, air and noise pollution, road wear and tear, increased use of fossil fuels, all those things. Um, and so to address those issues, as well as to provide transparency around pricing and also to improve customer service, the city is proposing to establish geographical zones and limit the number of carters that would be allowed to operate in each zone. Um, in our area, the map, the zoning map would follow generally our board um, footprint 
cut into two around 34th Street. Um, and those two zones that comprise CB5 have the greatest number of carters um, operating. <coughs> um, there are more than 50 carters that come into our district to collect waste and return it to transfer stations and dumping sites. Right now, the program is being reviewed for its potential environmental impact, and this is going to be released for published review and comment. We, um, Bex has submitted a letter on the draft scope of the work, and we hope to get some more information because we had a lot of questions about this process. Um, we're in the process of looking to carry out more due diligence on the issue. We want to find out more about it. We're reaching out to the business owners, the bids, the carters, and the other stakeholders. Um, we were the first uh, bid, uh, board to have a presentation on the issue. Um, so we're going to keep you updated in the coming months as, as this moves forward. Um, the second presentation that we had was from Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. They've been really good about keeping us in the loop about what's happening uh, um, on the hospital on 17th Street and what's going to happen on 14th Street, which is going to replace the current hospital. Um, we've been assured that the current emergency room and the services that are associated with the ER there will not close until the doors open on, at the new facility on 14th Street. Um, that's expected in 2000, late 2022 or early 2023. Um, Mount Sinai also announced that they're not going to be renovating the Bernstein Pavilion as originally planned, um, where they provide mental health um, facilities. It's very expensive to renovate, and the hospitals found a site that was better suited for the um, wraparound services that they're going to provide, um, that they wish to offer their patients. So instead of Bernstein, they're going to offer those services at the former Rivington House. Um, and that is expected late 2021, early 2022. And that um, were, was our reports, and we'll keep you updated as they keep us updated on that. Wonderful. Thank you, Renee. Are there any questions? OK. Seeing none, we will move on to landmarks. Layla. <coughs> All right, good evening, everyone. Um, before we start uh, with our committee report, I would like to uh, say a few words about Jack Taylor, who was uh, really an inspiration for me. Uh, he taught me so much. Um, we owe him <coughs> so much that um, I, I don't even know where to start. Um, we owe him the Ladies Mile Historic District, the whole district. It took him so long, and it was such a big fight. And he was so passionate and so enamored with uh, this district. And he gave us all on the committee the, the gift of love for <coughs> architecture, love for historic preservation, because there was such a deep understanding of what it is. It is not just because, oh, well, we like it, we don't like it. He told us so much about contextuality, um, why it is important to preserve. Um, and he was so knowledgeable, so incredibly knowledgeable. No knowledgeable, of course, about history and architecture, uh, but also knowledgeable about all the different actions that had been taken. You know, he could. Remember that in 1981, the, uh, the Design Commission actually ruled on planters that should not be deemed historic in historic districts in CB5, but in Soho, they are okay. And it's like, <laughs> Jack, I mean, he, crazy, crazy, like in the details, and you could never, ever fault him. He was always right <laughs> and so humble and so pleasant in demeanor and bringing such a great sense of collegiality to our committee meetings. It was just such a joy, such a joy. And um, when he decided to step down um, after 32 years, I think, mm -hmm. um, it was just such a void that he left. Uh, very often when uh, I chair the meetings, I think about him, I think about what he would think, how he would approach things, certainly in the historic, uh, in the Ladies Mile Historic District, I always think, you know, what would Jack think? Would, would he go with that? Would, would he be okay with that? Uh, I miss his 
uh, testimonies at LPC. He was such a great writer. He was a fabulous writer, and he would make these statements very brief, very very concise, which is the hardest form of writing. And uh, he would just kill it every single time. And the commissioners would be like, ah, such a joy, such a joy, and such a loss for a city. And, and my heart is just filled with gratitude for what he has accomplished, which is just so enormously remarkable. I mean, we, we haven't been able to preserve the swath of, of New York that he has been able to preserve, and, and I'm just so grateful for that. We lost two great people when Joyce left us. Yes. Joyce Matz yeah. and Jack. They were the originals on Landmarks for yeah. many, many years, and both of them contributed the way you're yeah. describing. We, we owe them so people. much. Yeah. We owe them so much. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we have two uh, interesting uh, items tonight. Um, one of them, I think Jack would have approved the uh, outcome. Uh, so let's start on uh, page uh, seven. Uh, this is uh, an application for the New York Public Library. This is a uh, individual landmark. Um, it is both a uh, exterior landmark and some interiors uh, of the library are also landmarked, but what is in front of us concerns um, uh, only the, uh, the exterior of, uh, of the building and uh, mostly uh, the, uh, 40, the 40th Street uh, side of, uh, of the building. So as you have heard tonight through uh, a number of testimonies, uh, this application is actually connected to a broader master plan. Uh, the New York Public Library has been working on this master plan for uh, many years now. They have given uh, many uh, presentations, both on the uh, architectural impact of this master plan and the programming. Um, and uh, now they're in front of us with uh, a, an application specifically to do some alterations uh, to create uh, a new entrance on uh, 40th Street. In order to do that, they need to transform an existing window into uh, a door. They are also proposing to enlarge a uh, loading dock. The loading dock currently is getting beat up by uh, truck traffic and uh, is uh, pretty deteriorated. Um, they are also proposing to create, to remove some uh, electrical and mechanical equipment that they're going to locate on the roof of the building. And um, they're going to reclaim this uh, space on 40, 40th Street and they're going to uh, create a terrace. Um, the, uh, so the, the mechanical equipment that will go on the roof is not visible and this is not an issue. Um, overall, the committee felt that the, uh, the spirit of what is being proposed is actually uh, good and is sympathetic to the building. So we didn't have any issue with uh, the substance of what is in front of us. Uh, transforming a window into a door, no problem. The, the historic fabric that is going to be removed, you know, obviously they, they have to, uh, you know, break down what is underneath this uh, window is actually brick, it is not marble, and um, they have actually made a commitment that even this brick, um, they're going to salvage and uh, reuse when, when and where uh, needed. Uh, the loading dock, quite frankly, um, if they don't do it properly and you know cutting and shaving the sides, it's gonna be shaved no, no matter what. So they may as well do it uh, tactfully and carefully. Uh, so. Definitely, there's going to be a little bit of historic uh, fabric removed. It is stone, uh, but once again, they're going to do it uh, very carefully. Um, the, uh, the existing historic fabric is going to be salvaged and kept and used and reused and repurposed uh, when needed. So all the, the, the spirit of what they're doing is, is fine. Removing this electrical and mechanical uh, equipment is totally fine and creating a terrace is going to be an enhancement and it complements the, uh, the building. Uh, just to clarify one comment that was made, uh, this entrance will be used by anyone who wants to use it and although it will be uh, 
more um, conducive to be used by students beca because it will be adjacent to a room that will be dedicated to uh, students. Students will be allowed to use any entrance. There is uh, no discrimination. There is no segregation. There is no uh, differentiation between these, these doors. I just want to make that very clear. Um, so the committee overall uh, felt that you know what is in front of us and the alterations that are uh, being proposed are, are fine. Now the treatment of these uh, alterations is what the committee had an issue with. Overall, uh, and you can see it on the uh, on the visuals that are um, included in the package, um, what they're proposing is actually fairly sleek and modern. Um, it is uh, an architectural choice that they're making, and uh, the committee believes that it is actually not sympathetic to the building and uh, that it is not contextual. Um, the, uh, the stonework that they're proposing is very plain. Um, the, uh, the paving that they're proposing for the terrace um, is actually quite uh, busy and uh, really doesn't uh, fit the, the paving that is um, on Fifth Avenue, uh, that is you know, much more uh, grand. Um, and uh, the, the metal work is uh, actually very, uh, very sleek and uh, there's not too much ornament. So the committee felt that uh, the, this treatment was uh, problematic. <coughs> we also had an issue with signage. So uh, the, uh, the New York Public Library is uh, proposing, as you can see on, um, uh, on page 10, um, the, uh, the, the printout is not super clear, but you can see this uh, flower bed that is flanked by a small wall and there's gonna be uh, a carving of uh, one of their donors and they want to uh, honor this uh, donor who's making a, uh, a, a great contribution to the library. Um, the, uh, the positioning of the signage is very prominent. It's really the first thing you see when you enter the, uh, the, the space and uh, the lettering is actually quite large. Uh, we were assured that uh, the lettering is actually going to be smaller than what is shown on the rendering, um, but still it's going to be very prominent. So we had an issue with that. We also had an issue with uh, the fact that um, Stephen Schwartzman's name is going to carve yet another time. Uh, we learned that uh, contractually, any time a uh, door is created, his name goes next to the door in the stone. It's in the contract. Um, it could be more discreet, and the committee felt that it was um, a little overwhelming and overbearing. So overall, we're uh, making a recommendation to deny unless the design becomes more sympathetic to, uh, to the building. We are not suggesting that it should be a pastiche. We're not suggesting it should be copying what exists, but uh, something that is uh, more harmonious, uh, because right now we feel that it's very plain and modern and um, we believe that the signage should be um, reduced and, and made uh, more discreet. We do appreciate that they are reducing the, the height of the lampposts. Um, this, uh, this is an improvement and we appreciate that they took uh, our concern into, uh, into account, uh, but we believe that they could go even further. And we certainly want to let LPC know that we have concerns with those areas that I just uh, underscored. So it was a uh, deny unless uh, those uh, conditions are met. Okay, are there any conflicts with this application? Are there any questions to the resolution? Are there any comments? John. Yes, um, the one thing that struck me about the committee meeting is it was uh, this, on this particular resolution was very long and a significant part of our discussion um, and the questions from um, from the public uh, were um, asking questions and asking us to address issues that were beyond the scope of the application. And um, it's my personal view that in there are certain cases that warrant uh, the board addressing the broader issues that the public is concerned about. And I, I just think in this particular case, we need to make sure that the executive committee and the chair of CB5 uh, come up with the appropriate forum. I don't know whether that's a, a joint committee or some other forum 
where the, the many, many issues that were raised about this plan can be addressed. That's point one. Point two, um, I'm hoping you can include something about ADA in here. Uh, anytime we can plug ADA, yes. that, uh, it would be useful to put that into a resolution also. And this will act, increase access to the building from an ADA perspective outside. And though the scope of this resolution doesn't talk about the internal part of the building, we learned about it, a lot about it at our meeting. Um, and uh, it will allow people uh, who have ADA needs or young people uh, or people with children, they will be able to, uh, uh, to uh, see a lot more of the library um, a lot easier. Yeah, you're raising a very good point. Uh, we will add language okay. uh, to, to that effect mm -hmm. that indeed it is, it is going to increase the accessibility of, uh, of the building okay, really great. significantly. Thank you, John. I know. I'm really struggling about Jack, so that's kind of what the chances are going to say. Um, I, I, this was really complicated, and Layla just did a real magnificent job of leading the committee and of talking through how this went. There's one thing I would, I want to raise because I think it sets precedent or wouldn't set, could have set a precedent for this group, and also to consider adding to the language, which is, um, <coughs> in the public session where they talk about wanting to make sure an addition or a change like the terrace is not looking like it's supposed to be part of the original. And I agree with that. But there's a giant difference between looking like trying to fake the original and using that as a reason to do whatever you want because it doesn't look like the original, which would set so many precedents that you could almost do anything separate from that. And um, I would suggest or ask that we might make that point because it's important to work against what they were saying, which is it's not about us saying we want it to look exactly like, but we want it to be appropriate and contextual yeah. in here. And I may not be saying this best because my mind is twirling. Yeah, but but I, I, I hear you. Yeah. Make that point. Yeah, and, and we, we certainly do. Board to yeah, that. we certainly discussed that at, at committee. We, we can, uh, I, I'll, I'll add a, a sentence that I'll uh, share with you when we can add that to the um, to the resolution. Okay. Great. Any other comments? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I, I want to support strongly what John just said about. Yeah, I, I've been struggling. I've actually been focusing on libraries, trying to do that with the Bex committee, and you know, my answer is sort of, well, is it budget? If if it's budget, we can deal with it. Is it landmarks? We can deal with it. And I'm new, new to the board, so I don't know what, how these things have been addressed in the past. But here's a very big issue in our, in our district. The, the, you know, the, the stacks, the, uh, the, hour, the hours of operation, and I don't know where to, how within our community board are we able to address that? Is that going to a committee? Is it something that happens outside of the committee? But these are some real issues about the plans for the library, and I, I, don't, I don't know how we address yeah. that. The, this, well, uh, the, the board has uh, always maintained that those applications that come before us, whatever is in the application, is what we address. That doesn't mean that we cannot address some of the issues that you're both talking about at another time. Right. But every application that, becomes, that comes before us we have to look at it in, in that form. Otherwise, we would be there on, you know, a vast amount of, of other extenuating or additional or related issues that people come and talk to us about. No, I agree. I mean, I would absolutely think we did the right thing in terms of Right. In, in, so in, in are you asking if we have the ability to take up those issues? That's right. That's right. what and I'm asking. Sure. About. Absolutely. But in what vein? In the vein that the committee chair and myself and the executive committee collectively can say we've had a large group of public um, response right. or questions or comments and we think we ought to have some sort of forum. It could be a hearing, it could be within the committee meeting, there are all different ways and, of and, dealing and with it. Could we add a for could we then opine on it as a board in some way? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, sorry. we're doing that with tall towers. They're, they're <coughs> not before. I mean, specific issues with tall towers are before right. us. 
but when we did the Sunshine Task Force, I think that was a good example of we knew that that was going to be a problem. It was a problem. We had how many people? 500 people show up for Six, that hearing? 600. That's right. Um, because it was so controversial and so uh, in need of discussion. And people to this day, um, when, I, when I talk about it, for instance, with my other, um, the other chairs of the other boards, they all say, oh, we remember that, that hearing. It was, it just really sparked something throughout Manhattan in particular. So the answer is yes, we certainly would not, um, we would not, exclude those kinds of discussions when people come to us and the public comes to us with very specific concerns that are not necessarily in front of us in an application. Okay. Where are we? Sorry. That was a comment. comment. <laughs> Todd. Okay. So one of the things that was mentioned in the public session, and I, I heard Layla, you talked about it too, and we struggle with this in the parks, our parks committee, we were constantly trying to uh, make sure that the notices and signs that get put up on our landmarks and beautiful buildings are somehow in proportion and appropriate. But this mania of the donors plastering their names on, I mean, it's the New York Public Library with the lions. I mean, is there anything that we as a community board or you as the committee, I was just looking at the resolution, is there somehow or some way we can go on, re on, on record and discourage that? Well, we are on record. We are on record from the time the, uh, the, the New York Public Li Library was renamed the uh, Stephen Schwartzman uh, Library. Um, so we, we are on record, and today we're on record saying that the signage is too big. We are on record. So it just seems like a shame. I mean, his name is on the building, but you know, can he have a plaque instead of engraving it? Well, right. you know, we don't, we don't make decisions, we make recommendations, but we're certainly on record saying that, you know, it's too big and too much. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, we're going to bundle, okay. if, if that's okay. Okay, so we'll go on to the next one. Um, okay, so the second um, item on the agenda was actually um, a, uh, an application to the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission requesting a report approving a continuing maintenance program pursuant to section 81-64 of the zoning resolution. So this is a um, East Midtown rezoning uh, type of, um, of action. Basically, as you know, in the uh, newly rezoned uh, East Midtown District, um, there is a process for uh, landmark, individual landmarks to transfer their uh, air rights. In order to do that, they have to have a report um, that is signed off by uh, the Landmarks Reservation Commission um, stating that they have a continuing ma maintenance program and it's in perpetuity. So the way it works now under this new, uh, new zoning text that was uh, adopted in 2018 is that um, each building, landmark building, before they um, finalize any transaction has to get this report. And then each time they sell their air rights, they have to come back to us and tell us what they're doing, uh, in, like how many uh, square feet of air rights they're selling and um, how many, um, how much uh, budget they are dedicating to, uh, to the maintenance. Uh, of course, that, is, uh, that does not include any review of any work that they uh, would propose to do. So they would still go uh, through the same review process uh, for any work and any maintenance that, uh, that they would do. But this is a good, um, sort of, uh, you know, catalog of all the areas that may need uh, maintenance. It has to be areas that are uh, of landmark significance. You know, they cannot earmark this, uh, these funds for, you know, fixing the, uh, the plumbing or repairing an elevator. It has to be specifically, specifically dedicated to keeping the building in uh, the, the best possible condition and uh, keeping its um, historic and architectural uh, fabric. 
Um, they told us, so the, the central synagogue, um, as you probably know, is in very good condition. Um, they did extensive work, you know, very unfortunately there was a fire, but this uh, resulted in uh, actually an exquisite uh, restoration of the building. Uh, the building is in good condition. Um, the budget that is needed to keep the building in good, in good condition is actually not that high. Um, they told us that they do not have a, uh, a buyer for the air rights yet, uh, but we certainly know that there's a lot of activity in East Midtown and uh, lots of developments that are uh, possibly That's coming true. online. Uh, we know of the, uh, the Maclow site across from uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral. We also learned uh, last week of the, uh, the Grand Hyatt Hotel, which is going to be torn down and redeveloped, although uh, DCP told us all along that it would never happen. Happen, and well, yeah, <coughs> it did, or it is. Um, but uh, the Central Synagogue told us that for the moment they are not, um, they have not entered into um, any uh, final transaction. Uh, the, uh, the maintenance plan um, is good. Uh, what they have identified as uh, areas that may need some maintenance is uh, meaningful, and um, we trust that um, th they're going to remain a uh, very good custodian uh, and steward of this uh, beautiful building. So we voted to approve. Great. Are there any conflicts with this application? Any questions to the resolution? Nancy. No. Nope. No. <laughs> and they and they said and they said that much. We've we've asked uh, the Department of City Planning. So, who keeps tab? Um, no one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who, who? No. <laughs> they don't, and they have not hired uh, a uh, an independent consultant. Um, they're thinking about it. something not right now but is it something that should be taken up maybe land use or yes land? absolutely maybe we need to put that on our yes we should we should write a resolution to bring yeah because that's a problem right yes I mean, absolutely absolutely any other questions Andres is it common practice that the, uh, the approved air rights transfer without knowing where they go we're not approving, not approving but we're not uh, approving air rights trans transfers they can transfer their air rights as of right, because the, uh, the, new zone, the new zoning of East Midtown allows them to do. What they presented to us is a maintenance plan in perpetuity that will be under the jurisdiction of uh, the Landmarks Preservation Commission, meaning that every seven years there will be an inspection of the building. Uh, it's very similar to a local law 11 for those of you who live in buildings that are taller than uh, seven stories where you know your facade has to be inspected by an engineer and has to produce a report saying that the building is in good condition. So this is very similar. But that, that process starts before the 142,000 of air rights. In order for them to sell any air rights, even half in a square foot, they have to have this report in place. Any other questions? Any comments? All right, seeing none, we are voting on these two resolutions. Whalen? Yes. Weintraub? Yes. Webb? Oh. Smith? Yes. Slutskin? Yes. Shapiro? Yes. Raybar? Yes. Miller? Yes. McCall? Yes. Mann? Yes. Mafia? Yes. Wagasico? Yes. Kinsella? Yes. Kalafarski? Yes. Kavak? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Isaac? Yes. Harris, Hoff, yes. Greeley, yes. Gashow, yes. Goldberg, yes. Gatto, yes. Dale, yes. Clark, yes. Chu, yes. Benzie, yes. Beichman, yes. Athenale. Yes. Okay, the resolutions pass, land use, housing, and zoning. Thank you. Uh, before we go to uh, committee report, uh, like to, to the applications, um, Two things that I would like to tell you about. The first one is um, I would like to let you know that uh, <coughs> Rene Kinsella and I are spearheading a little um, task force slash uh, working group that is going to focus on uh, the charter revision. As you know, um, the, uh, the city council um, is working on a, uh, a charter revision looking at 
uh, you know, how the charter can uh, be uh, upgraded and uh, better reflect uh, today's ways of, uh, you know, the, the city doing business, really. Uh, and operating, and um, mm -hmm. the uh, so the, the the city council created a uh, a, char a charter revision commission, and um, we have an opportunity to uh, you know make recommendations. Um, so if you have any uh, thoughts or any suggestions um, on uh, how the charter, the the city charter, could be uh, updated, upgraded, uh, and uh, improved. Uh, reach out to Renee, reach out to me, and uh, we will certainly uh, try to incorporate uh, all the suggestions that are, um, that are coming our way. <coughs> there is a uh, website that is um, fairly informative. Um, I think it's uh, charterrevisioncommission.org or something like that, but certainly if you, if you Google uh, Charter Revision Commission 2019, you should be able to, uh, to find it. Do you want to mention who's on the committee? On the task force? Uh, I don't have the list, but uh, <laughs> it, it's not very long. Uh, the, the members of the, uh, the task force are uh, E.J. Kalafarski, um, Tristan, Tristan Haas, right. uh, Rachel. Sorry, I don't remember your last name. <laughs> um, Renee uh, Kinsella, <coughs> uh, Aaron Ford, and myself. Am I missing anyone? Renee? Yeah, it was six people. Right? Yeah. Uh, so, by all means, if you are uh, interested in uh, this area, uh, reach out to, uh, to any of us. Uh, the second uh, item that I would like to mention is that uh, we heard today that uh, JP Morgan Chase uh, has decided to uh, rework the designs of their um, tower. And uh, we have been told that this tower will incorporate a 10,000 square foot open space as opposed to the 7,000 that they had initially proposed. Uh, so they're uh, bringing their building to full compliance. And um, this is a sweet moment because um, we fought hard for that. Uh, this board is on record um, telling J.P. Morgan Chase that um, 7,000 was simply not going to cut it, and uh, they heard us. Who so dares say community boards don't matter? <laughs> Who dares? There's a good example. Yeah. Uh, we have not seen the, uh, the, pr the new proposed design, and we're uh, very eager uh, to see you know, how they figured out. Um, given that they had told us all along that it was not feasible. So it's going to be interesting to see how it is now not only feasible but doable and they're going to do it. Um, hopefully it is good design uh, and uh, we will certainly uh, report back uh, on, uh, on that. Um, so that's it for my uh, little okay. report. We can go mm -hmm. to applications. Okay. so. The first application that we reviewed uh, at committee is an application by the Department of City Planning to modify residential tower floor area provision in the zoning, uh, the zoning resolution 23-16. It is colloquially known as the mechanical void loophole. So let me explain to you what is the mechan a mechanical loophole. Uh, you may have wondered um, how these buildings get so darn tall on 57th Street, right? H how do they build so tall? H how do they do that? Um, what they have done in four instances on 57th Street is that they basically put a mechanical room that is 150 foot high. So 150 foot high, just for reference, it's a 12-story building, okay? So they basically created a big void that is the height of a 12-story building, and then they kept building above that. And they claim that this 150-foot room um, doesn't count towards their allotted floor areas and their, their floor area ratio, uh, which, you know, converts into, uh, you know, square feet, uh, because it's mechanical, and because mechanical doesn't count towards FAR, okay? So 
developers um, and you know lo lots of them were able to basically raise their towers. It's like you're putting a building on stilts, really, with a whole hollow core. Uh, because they know that the more valuable portion of the building is towards the uh, the top because this is where the views are. And as our friend Gary Barnett said many times, that's the money shot. Um, so for many years, we actually uh, tried to raise hell with uh, the mayor, with uh, the Department of City Planning, and uh, to no avail. <coughs> and uh, we're very pleased that uh, the Department of City Planning has taken notice and um, has acknowledged that it is a problem and has made, uh, you know, taken the step to fixing uh, the problem. So we heard a presentation last week where the Department of City Planning explained to us how they uh, assessed the existing condition and how they came to uh, the recommendation that they're making. So um, they assessed all the buildings that were built in the past 10 years in uh, residential uh, districts or commercial districts with a residential equivalent of R9 and R10, which roughly means that it was a 9 FAR uh, to a 10 FAR. So they looked at all these residential buildings throughout the entire city, and they looked at the height of the mechanical rooms. And the height of the mechanical rooms was between 10 and 12 feet in all of these buildings except seven. And in these seven, the, uh, the mechanical rooms were 150 foot, and they were all mega towers, and four of them are located in CB5. So, based on this uh, assessment, they basically decided to come with a metric that basically says, if you're going to build uh, me a mechanical room that is ex exceedingly high, then when it reaches a certain height, anything that goes above is going to count, okay? So it will be deducted from the density that you are, um, that you are allowed to use. So if they want a 150 foot uh, mechanical room, is, if for design purposes they find that it is actually pretty and it's fun or cool or you know, they fancy that, they can do it. It's not prohibited in any way, shape or form. The, the, the amendment is just saying that now anything that is above 25 feet of mechanical equipment will be counted as a uh, floor area. Um, and then what the amendment is saying is that uh, you can basically like stuff your um, 25 feet of mechanical equipment every 75 feet, okay? So you start from the ground, 75 feet, you can have 25 feet of mechanical room. You can build another 75 feet, another 25 feet of mechanical room, and so on and so forth. If you want to do more than that, if you want to put mechanical rooms, uh, mechanical rooms every 50 feet, once again, you can. It's perfectly allowed. You can design your building whichever way you want, no restriction. It's just that it's going to count towards your FAR. Um, so, the committee was very eager and very appreciative that uh, DCP is finally taking notice that there is a problem. There is a serious, serious problem. It is really a loophole. Uh, building buildings on stilts was not intended um, and is not done for any reason other than uh, you know, getting a higher price for those uh, top uh, apartments. And as a result, you have buildings that are taller than what they should be, and taller buildings end up having negative impacts that uh, are not mitigated. One of them that we've been talking a lot about on, uh, on this board is the shadows that these towers cast uh, on uh, public open space and parks. Um, very unfortunately, a lot of these towers have sprouted on the south side of Central Park, which means that they directly impact Central Park because, you know, the, they're on the south and the sun goes like that and therefore, you know, the park is in the shadows pretty much from morning to evening. I mean, the shadow moves, but when you have 
a whole wall of super tolls, you basically cast the entire southern portion of, uh, of the park into shadows, and those shadows actually reach all the way to 72nd Street. So very appreciative that DCP uh, took notice, but the committee had an issue with, not with the formula, we actually like the formula. We think that there should be a, a, a mechanism where air rights start to count when you're reaching you know, a certain mechanical uh, height that um, is, is higher than uh, the average. Uh, so we, we like the formula, we don't like the numbers that are plugged into this formula. We don't like 25 feet and we don't like 75 feet. So the committee felt that um, the, uh, the mechanical rooms should be closer to the average, and we know, and uh, city planning has been uh, pretty clear, that the average of all the buildings that they surveyed is between 10 and 12. So we're not saying that it should be 12, you know, maybe it should be 15. <coughs> we're not the experts, but we feel that 25 is, is too big. And uh, a repeat of the, this mechanical equipment every 75 feet um, doesn't make sense. Uh, we actually have a number of architects on, on the committee who were very helpful in um, uh, educating us on the needs and uh, the, you know, the, the, the location of, of uh, these mechanical units. Mechanical units are actually getting smaller and not bigger. Um, so, you know, it, it's pretty clear that um, if you're really committed to, cl to closing this loophole, um, the repeat should not be 75 feet, but it should, we believe that it should be between 100 and, 100 and 150. Um, but 75 is simply uh, too low. So, um, the, the committee voted uh, to deny the application unless this matrix is reviewed. Now, the big er problem that we had uh, last week is that we found out while reviewing this uh, zoning tax amendment that most of it will not apply to CB5. Why? We don't know. We are ground zero for mechanical voids. We're ground zero for buildings on stilts. And the proposal that is in front of us simply doesn't cover like 90% of CB5, including 57th Street, where we know that there are at least four soft sites that are just ripe for development, so ripe that actually last week, as we were discussing this particular issue with DCP, developers were actually pulling demolition permits to hasten the process of <coughs> demolishing existing buildings on 57th Street, I'm not even talking about the Rizzoli site, which is already flattened. Two other sites are getting primed for redevelopment and will be able to be built on stilts. Um, DCP told us that um, there will be a second phase to this uh, zoning tax amendment. The, zone, the, the second phase should come in June. Uh, we <coughs> are very confident that by June, all the <coughs> construction permits of buildings on stilts along 57th Street will already have been pulled and already been granted lawfully by the Department of Buildings and the damage will be done and it will be too late. Uh, the rationale for uh, DCP on their map simply makes no sense. So as much as we see value in the formula and we don't really like the numbers. We're totally in line with Ben Kalos. Maybe on that front, it could be an approval with conditions rather than a denial. Okay, we, we can, you know, discuss that maybe. I don't, I mean, the committee was very clear that, you know, it, it should be a denial. Um, but, you know, we certainly appreciate that there's some value in, you know, undertaking this work. But the fact that we are excluded from the protection of this new tax amendment is simply unacceptable, unconscionable, and uh, really got us quite worked up at, at the committee meeting. Uh, so we passed a resolution to deny this, uh, this amendment. It is not that we don't want to close the loophole, I would just wanna make that very, very clear, but uh, DCP really needs to do a better job so that we are finally protected from these uh, construction and design practices that are simply unacceptable. 
ok does anyone have a conflict madam chair i think i need to declare a conflict ok thank you anyone else uh, questions a oh, question. this is a question yeah a comment you do, ok questions first buzz could you please clarify the difference it uh, wasn't clear to me between the committee and uh, Councilman Cloud Kellos. <coughs> what he he alluded to. Council Member Kalos believes that um, we should issue a, 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 a recommendation of support with conditions rather than issuing a denial with conditions. I'm sorry, what, what would be the effect of that? In you would have to ask him. S specifically. Uh, you would have to ask him. I'm, a, I'm to oh, totally sorry, puzzled. Boss. I don't no. understand. Yeah. He doesn't want the word deny. I know. Mm -hmm. um, did you consider or would you consider two pieces? On line 364 where you mentioned reducing to less than 25 feet and close to the average of 12 to 15, but in the resolve, 377, it just says less than 25 feet, which I would be afraid could be 24 feet. And Re Repeating this number, repeating absolutely. The closer to 12 to 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the second part, when you're talking about leaving out 25, would be in the second resolve, as opposed to revising the multi-phase rollout, would you consider saying that to include the CV5 in the rollout, in the immediate rollout, just to clarify and, and strengthen, potentially strengthen that? In the yes. second result. In the second right. result. Mm -hmm. Okay, it will read um, uh, advice city planning to uh, include CV5 in the current iteration of the zoning tax amendment. Thank you. <coughs> Other questions? Wait. Uh, on, on 344, I actually don't remember this issue about mechanical floors above the highest residential floor not being subject to this. What What is that 344? about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, turn to page 13. Page 13. Mm, 12. No, turn to page 13 oh. to the little diagram. You got it? Okay. Um, you see um, in the appropriate mechanical space diagram, basically the top mechanical bulkhead can be any height that they want. Why? Because typically um, some developers find that there is a need to put the mechanical uh, equipment on the roof. And um, if there is no residential above, then they have no incentive of making it taller. And therefore, it doesn't need to be regulated because everybody is pretty confident that it will self-regulate. That basically, you want this bulkhead space to be as small as possible. And what's interesting to note is that the trend in construction is that mechanical bulkheads are disappearing. They are a dying breed. Maybe good, maybe bad, I don't know. Because all the mechanical equipment is actually installed in the core of the building in order to reclaim the top <coughs> floors that are then dedicated to palatial uh, penthouses that have, as Nancy said it, and it's very important, I think everybody should hear it. Nancy made, made us very aware of that. I, was, I didn't know, but basically from these apartments, you have ocean views, okay? And this is what is selling. This is 700 feet tall to get the ocean view 14 miles away. Think about that. Okay, so basically the, 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 the marketing line for them is that you're delivering ocean views. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is more profitable to use the mechanical bulk, bulkhead to get the ocean views right. than to leave the ocean views to some uh, HVAC compressor. Is it possible to explain to people why this map is so impactful to Community Board 5? This one doesn't show it, but Ben Kalos' map really shows them. I just want people to yes. understand. Yeah, if you, if you can hold it like that so everybody can see it, that's super helpful. 
Um, okay, so those, those two maps basically represent the same thing, except that one doesn't tell you anything, and the, and the other one, the one that Ben Kalos showed, uh, basically tells the story of what's happening. So basically, what is in blue, what is in blue or green, is mostly protected either by some height restrictions, some um, sky plane exposure restrictions, meaning that you cannot build a building that would penetrate the sky plane, uh, or you're really limited by the amount of penetration that you can do, um, or the zoning has to be contextual. In CB5, we have pretty much none of this, with the exception of the Ladies Mile Historic District. Please thank Jack Taylor in the deepest deep of your heart. Um, but that's about it, seriously. And uh, what uh, you see on this map that uh, Ben Kalos prepared is that um, basically Committee Board 5 and uh, a little bit of com Committee Board 1 uh, all the way in uh, lower Manhattan are um, basically at risk of getting these buildings on stilts. And under the current zoning tax amendment, um, these districts are not covered. So we're not covered. Part of CB4 are not covered. And uh, the, the financial district, uh, Lower Manhattan, is not covered. OK. <clears throat> Any other questions? Any comments? Nick. The rationale that DCP gave for not including CB5 is that this, these areas of CB5 are already special districts. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, as to Ina's point that we should say that we want this applied to CB5, should we not say that we want this to apply even to special districts? Because that includes CB5 and that also includes the downtown area. Well, I mean, we, we will certainly let downtown decide what they want. I mean, if they love buildings on stilts, they <laughs> have every right to, you know, <coughs> comment. But for, for us, um, certainly, actually, the, the fact that um, we are in special, actually, the special districts, if anything, encourage height. Right, and I'm thinking we, we need to address that head on, which is the, the essence of my comment. Should we, in our resolution, explain why it makes no sense to not protect special districts in this iteration. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that. At, at committee, you made a very good point that in special districts, they use a different way of uh, analyzing height. That the block thing? Oh yeah, the Waldrum analysis, yeah. Right, right. and how ineffective that is. Um, uh, I'm wondering if you think that it makes sense in this resolution to address that point head on. Yes, yes, we can, we can add. Um, okay, so basically one like hint of a start of an explanation by uh, DCP as to why CB5 could worry a little less, uh, although I mean they, they do appreciate that you know we, we should you know be covered by a zoning tax amendment. They're just not ready to do it now. Um, basically, they, they explained to us that there are some um, basically zoning uh, zoning regulations on the sky plane exposure. So once again, you know it is the amount of uh, of sky that a building is allowed to take. So if you take a, uh, a, a you know, a plain field and you build a tower, uh, there's nothing, it's a field, okay? It's a, you build a tower and that's all you have and this tower is gonna block some of the sky, okay? So imagine that you divide the, the, the panorama of sky into a grid and then you count the number of squares that are blocked by the building. And this is the principle of what is called, in the, the technical jargon, the Waldrum analysis. So it's a Waldrum diagram, and you basically count the number of squares. And basically, New York, in some areas, not all of them, but in some areas, has some restrictions. You cannot reach uh, a level higher than a certain number. Uh, these numbers are pretty big, but of course, if you have a very narrow street, 
the impact of a tower is going to be vastly different than if you have a broader perspective. So in the case of 57th Street, although there is a skyplane exposure threshold, because 57 is a wide avenue and because the, um, uh, the, the Grand Army Plaza, the, the, the Central Park Plaza, is um, very broad and has very open views, it is very easy to put a very tall building that would still comply. So that's what Nick is referring to, although it may be thought that there is a little bit of protection because of the special district um, uh, sky plane exposure requirement, it is actually not going to protect us from a, a super tall tower. And that's what DCP is saying, that we already have this protection, so we don't need um, the zoning text amendment. That's why they're carving out CB5. So I think we, we should address that in this resolution head on. Uh, about how ridiculous that is. Yes. Okay. Todd. So what we're talking about here, and again, I, I applaud the committee for fer you know, fishing this out and bringing it to everybody's attention, but the original sin is the failure and that led, or the lack of vision, or you know, the changes over time that led to this loophole, right? So, I mean, these people, the, profit motive and the demand for these spaces by the rich or the 1%, these giant buildings is driving this. Shouldn't there be any mention in, our, in, in the resolution of the failure of you know, the previous, of the previous re regulation and you know, the time element, the fact that, as you say, they're racing to put these things up? And did I hear that right? Yes. That unless, unless some action is taken in like three months, they're going to have, as of right, the ability to build four more of those monstrosities. Yes, I agree. Right. So I think it. I think it's in the spirit of what the committee discussed. Yeah. I mean, unless all of us have to put the pressure on our elected officials to to realize that there's a race against time. Yeah. Gonna, and and also, we, I'm just referring back to a couple of years ago when we had those presentations about the shadows. Yes. These four buildings are going to, what, increase the shadows by what percentage? Form, there's already four, there'll be another four, right? So maybe that should be mentioned. I mean, that's something that the, the average person can understand. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, in the spirit of what we discussed and yeah, okay. considered totally friendly. Well, I'm remembering the committee meeting where um, you said we've been, DCP, we've been telling you this for seven years. Can we add that somehow? I mean, this is not something that we're just telling DPC, DCP for the first time. Yeah. We've been telling for seven years, and you stated that so succinctly in our meeting that that needs, I think that needs to go in also, because this has been, we've been hammering at this for a while. Yeah. This is not new to this committee or to this board. Yeah. Okay. Friendly. Anyone else? Okay, uh, we're bundling. Uh, sure. But we didn't do. Oh, we didn't do the second one though. Yeah. Yeah. No, we didn't, no not we yet. Didn't do we're going to get to the uh, right. to the second one. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. So uh, the uh, second and final uh, item on uh, the uh, land mm -hmm. use agenda is um, actually a, uh, a, a a sort of. A policy statement, a, uh, a call for zoning resolution amendments addressing the rise of super tall buildings and a moratorium on uh, super tolls within the city pr uh, uh, until the city properly addresses their negative impacts. So uh, the genesis of uh, this, uh, this statement is uh, sort of like twofold. The Far, uh, you know, a long, long time ago, as you know, uh, seven years ago, uh, this board uh, started working on uh, the issue of super tolls when we saw uh, 157, actually we were stunned. Uh, it was entirely as of right, the whole thing grew and grew and grew and we're like, what is this thing? And then um, the, uh, the Nordstrom Tower uh, came along and showed us bits and pieces, piecemeal, and until the last moment, uh, we could not figure out what it is that they were building. 
uh, and then uh, came uh, 432, entirely as of right, uh, tons of mechanical voids all over, and um, we were uh, not happy about that. Uh, we, you know, put together a task force. Uh, we issued a 35-page uh, report that uh, assessed all the uh, the negative uh, impacts of uh, of these towers. Uh, the more salient being the uh, the shadows that they cast on on Central Park. Um, fast forward to today, uh, very unfortunately, no legislation was passed. No action was taken by the administration. And uh, we are still in the situation where uh, these towers are uh, spreading. There's a strong market. I think that the, the trophy property uh, market um, sees no end. I think people who can uh, purchase these uh, trophy apartments uh, are still very active and very interested in doing so. It's harder to sell the other units, but certainly the, the, the trophy, the, the crown of those buildings, uh, finds buyers quite easily. Uh, so, um, at the beginning we were a little lonely, um, and uh, now these towers are spreading all over uh, Manhattan and even in Brooklyn. And uh, recently, Community Board 7 uh, took the initiative to actually uh, draft a sort of, you know, policy statement and uh, decided to reach out to all the community boards in Manhattan and seek uh, their support. Uh, so this is what is in front of us. This is a, uh, an initiative that is driven by Community Board 7. The goal is to have all the community boards in the city to sign off on it. Uh, we know that Community Board 8 has already uh, signed off on it, and I believe Community Board 9 and maybe Community Board 2. Uh, but all the other community boards uh, what we, we have heard are uh, pretty sympathetic to, uh, to the language that is uh, contained in this, uh, in this letter. Uh, so what this letter says uh, basically is that we're urging the, uh, the administration and, uh, and the city council to basically take action. Um, we believe that it should be through zoning tax amendments because it's the easiest and most logical way to address these issues and that um, there should be a way to mitigate uh, shadow impacts on uh, public open space, uh, including parks and pops, um, that um, there should be uh, an assessment of uh, the impact on uh, historic resources, um, and uh, also an assessment of uh, the, uh, the fire safety issues that these, uh, these towers um, raise. Um, so what, uh, what CB7 uh, um, has suggested as uh, ways to resolve that is uh, to actually um, regulate the unoccupied structural spaces. So that is uh, being addressed by uh, DCP. Uh, we just reviewed that. <coughs> um, and uh, so also uh, another recommendation is uh, to limit the ceiling heights uh, because we know that, oh, actually, let me rephrase, not to limit it, but to actually make an excessive ceiling height uh, count towards some floor area ratio. Once again, uh, developers are perfectly allowed to do to build uh, their buildings whichever way they want. We're not limiting them and telling them that there are any restrictions. We're just telling them that if they want to do that, then it has to come out of their FAR uh, allowance. And uh, finally, there has to be a, uh, a lot merger um, regulation where uh, air rights from lot mergers cannot exceed a certain number. Um, and we believe that 10% is, um, is a, good, uh, a good limit. So um, short of taking these actions, uh, this letter calls for a moratorium. Uh, this is a position that this board uh, supported seven years ago. Um, we actually called for an 18-month moratorium. Uh, this letter calls for a 24-month moratorium. Quite honestly, if Ben Kalos tells us that it has to be a six-month moratorium, we'd be happy. Um, because really, you know, there has to be some commitment from the administration and the council that they're going to work on it, deal with it, fix it, and, um, and then once we have strong laws in the books, there will be no need for a moratorium. The goal is not to you know, freeze in perpetuity uh, development, but just you know, to give our legislators and the administration some time to work on it without causing uh, any further damage. 
So um, the committee felt that it was uh, a, good, uh, a good statement and we voted to support it. Okay, <clears throat> does anyone have a conflict? Okay, any questions to this resolution? Any comments? All right, seeing none, we are voting on the last two resolutions of the evening. Appenale. Yes. Beichman. Yes. Benzie. Yes. Chu. Yes. Clark. Yes. Dale. Yes. Cato. Yes. Goldberg. Yes. Gashow. Yes. Greeley. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Isaac. Yes. yes. Johnson. Yes. Kavak. Yes. Kalaparski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Logosico. Yes. Mafia. Yes. Mann. Yes. Nicole. Yes. Raybar. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Smith. Yes. Webb. Oh, uh, Weintraub. Yes. Whalen. Yes. All right. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day again. Thanks for the cupcakes. Thanks for the cupcakes. <laughs>